All right, hello and welcome. Today's webinar is Rethinking Streets During COVID-19. There is a link in the chat for the project website where you can download an evidence-based guide to 25 quick redesigns for public use in spatial equity. My name is Brendan Williams. I am the research program administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. CREC leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities a university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NHTSA's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. NHTSA consortium members are the University of Utah, the University of Oregon, the University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. Our presenters today are Dr. Mark Schlossberg, and we have three master's students who this spring will graduate from the University of Oregon's Community and Regional Planning Program. Mark is a professor of city and regional planning and co-director of the Sustainable Cities Institute at the University of Oregon. His work focuses on redesigning cities so that more people can use low or no carbon space efficient transport more of the time. Claire Haley is a 2020 2021 Eisenhower Transportation Fellow and is interested in micro mobility and mobility justice. Claire serves as co president of Live Move, a project driven active transportation student organization. John Larson Friend is interested in issues of equity, justice, and technological advancement surrounding transportation. In the spring of 2020, John created the first national database of US transit agencies responses to COVID-19. He is currently the planning intern for the city of Cottage Grove. Eliza Whalen is a 2020-2021 Eisenhower Transportation Fellow and NHTSA's Master's Student of the Year. Eliza is interested in transportation equity and improving mobility outcomes. All right, so before we get started, I'd just like to let you know about some upcoming online events. We have a Friday transportation seminar on April 16th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time. It's evaluation of a transportation incentive program for affordable housing residents. On April 23rd at 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Pacific time, we have another Friday transportation seminar on Oregon Walks pedestrian crash report. Cause, causes, effects, and recommendations. Our next NITSI webinar is on May 11th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Aaron Golub from Portland State University will present eliminating cash options for public transit fares, the costs, benefits, and equity impacts. On June 8th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, Kathy Liu from the University of Utah will present a NHTSA webinar on electric bus deployment, cost and environmental equity. All right, I'm gonna turn this over in a, in a moment. Um, just wanna say that their presentation is gonna be about 40 minutes long. After that, we're gonna have a Q&A session about 15 minutes. Please feel free to submit your questions in the Q and A uh, section of the Zoom dashboard. Um, that that'll really make it easy for us to handle them. Um, so after the webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. Uh, if you're tracking the professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit, and we'll have instructions on how to redeem the credit in the post webinar email. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Great. 
Thanks, Brendan. Let's get our slides up here. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in and uh, I'm really pleased, uh, we're all very pleased to share uh, what we think is a really helpful and amazing uh, resource and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with three amazing uh, graduate students all from the University of Oregon. So the outline for today is we will uh, cover the project in general, uh, provide a little bit of framing, who cares and so what, like why is this project interesting, important, uh, useful? Where does it fit into the scheme of things? We'll go through the organization of the resource itself, and then each of the students will take on a different subsection of the book and share some examples uh, from across the country. And then as Brendan said, we'll have some opportunity for, for some Q&A. I do want to acknowledge that there are three additional people who are involved in this uh, quick uh, return project. Uh, who could not be with us today uh, live uh, on the webinar. Uh, so Professor Rebecca Lewis, who's a professor of city planning at the U of O, and then two undergraduate students from the University of Oregon, Daniel Lewis, who was almost entirely in charge of all of the graphic design and layout of uh, the visual layout of the entire resource, and Nat uh, Kataoka, who was a, a core researcher uh, uh, for this book, and both our undergraduate students may have classes right now. Imagine that uh, staying and going to class. And then I want to make a few other acknowledgements before we get into the content here. Uh, and these are three, uh, one person and then two organizations, but obviously people behind the organizations that were really helpful for, the, for, the, for us uh, finding the right case studies to include in the book. So Professor uh, Tab Combs at UNC really got things going in the country by starting to document changes that were happening uh, in different communities uh, as the pandemic uh, was starting, changes that were happening to different streets. And then that led into a, a, a more robust and organized uh, hosting of a, of a live database from PBIC. And then NACDO as well uh, created a, their own live and accessible database of examples of, of streets from around the country that were going, undergoing changes uh, in our COVID era. And so picking through all of that and doing some of our own exploration came up with uh, a book, uh, a very accessible book called Rethinking Streets During COVID-19. And this is actually the third in a series of the Rethinking Streets case study books, all following a very similar format, but with slightly different focus on, on, each, on each book. So they're all accessible, uh, free, uh, no charge to download uh, online. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So the purpose of this book, of this book and this project really is, was to document a range of street changes that were happening uh, during COVID and to create a public facing resource. And this is really key for us, some way to communicate the changes that different communities were pursuing on their streets that would speak equally to planners, to engineers, to urban designers, to politicians and other community stakeholders, whether they work professionally uh, in the field around you know, transportation, or if they're just uh, concerned community members trying to make a difference in their community. We wanted a resource that could um, uh, speak to, to each group uh, equally. We wanted to organize the information consistently so that the information was accessible quickly by any one of these stakeholder groups. And ultimately what we hope to do is provide enough breadth of examples from uh, enough parts of the country that it would lower the risk, meaning the political risk for other communities to make changes to their streets by seeing that they're not the first one out of the gate to do things, that they can grab examples from other communities and understand what those other communities did and then maybe um, they could act themselves. So just as a, a sort of a, a context here, it's important to remember that you know, redesigning a street is often a very contentious process. Uh, we have a bit of a def default viewpoint of streets in, in the US at least, that the purpose of the street is to move and store private vehicles as a primary function and everything else is uh, sort of an add-on bonus for most parts of most of our communities. And so whenever a local city proposes to redesign a street, it often is quite a contentious process uh, that involves some sort of public engagement to decide what 
what to do to redesign that street. And what's important to realize in this COVID moment is that quick changes happened and that the quick COVID changes were real changes, both to the redesign of streets and to the process by which streets were redesigned. So they were done very quickly with, with often minimal public engagement or different type of, of public engagement because the changes needed to happen to respond to the immediate needs of the pandemic. And changes to our streets are desperately needed, which is the context for all three of the resource books. We need to really rethink and redesign our streets if we're gonna meet our challenges around climate change, around equity, around household affordability, around spatial distancing during this time, especially for public health in general and many other issues like municipal uh, affordability, social trust, independence and freedom and other types of uh, aspects that our streets are not serving uh, the broad public and our broad public challenges as well as they should. So this is a very interesting time then to rethink the street for the future. And there's been lots of writing if you follow any type of popular press out there about um, you know, the, watching the changes that have happened during this era and, and what might happen in the future around you know, what to do with streets that maybe have fewer cars, uh, how to totally rethink city centers that have, been, uh, have gone over to car dominance. Are there a better way to do things? Um, how to rethink how our kids get to school, given that uh, there's some, maybe some new opportunities on our streets. Uh, there's been quite a bit of recent evidence coming out that the quick strike pop-up infrastructure that makes it easier to get around by bike actually leads to more people biking, which is actually not uh, a surprise because we know that basically induced demand works for any mode. If you build more lanes on a freeway, you get more cars. If you build more high quality bike infrastructure, you get more people on biking, and we're seeing that evidence. So cities are thinking about the future. Uh, uh, are we returning to some pre-COVID normal, or is there a new normal going forward now we think about our streets? We obviously need to do something uh, because uh, traffic and access and equity and climate are uh, have all uh, not been uh, met in our pre-COVID times. And of course, there's been record bike sales. Um, and then for the dining side, you know, many of our communities have now discovered or rediscovered that the public street actually makes for a nice public outdoor experience as well. So these are all kind of the big contexts. And it's important, obviously, to realize that changes to our streets have been happening and really accelerating, I would say, over the last 20 years in a variety of ways. Clearly, there are whole, uh, uh, sis, uh, whole projects of protected bike lanes across the United States that have been popping up all across the country, um, hopefully working toward connected systems. There's been efforts to skinny the street or put art in the street to make it uh, slow down uh, car movement and enhance the pedestrian realm. Uh, some cities are making bus only lanes, parklets, kind of the reclaiming of parking spaces for more public uses have all been happening. But many of those changes are just not been happening at, this, at the speed by which changes have happened over this last uh, 13 or 14 months um, as communities have had to respond to our uh, social isolation and the need for accessing public space closer to where we live and supporting new ways of getting around that is both safe and comfortable in many ways, including being able to be spatially distant from one another uh, until we're all safe to be closer which all leads into the creation of this resource. So that's all the context for this resource uh, and the backdrop behind it. So the, the book itself is organized uh, in a variety of different uh, sections. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty long. There's a, a lot of nice examples in here. So uh, this book, like the other two books, start with a bit of context um, setting. So some basic information uh, they vary across the different books, but some basic information that helps uh, set the stage, provide a little bit of information or context around transportation planning or how to think about the street. So information that actually elevates the capacity for more people locally to engage in transportation conversations with municipal staff uh, and politicians, but really with that municipal staff 
often there's a lot of jargon and sort of proprietary-ish knowledge that professionals in transportation have that's really hard to access uh, by a general public. And so we wanna break down some of those barriers so that more people um, in the public can engage um, in these types of conversations about what the purpose of our street is. So there's some of this front matter. Then we break down the cases by different types of street treatments that have happened over the last year. Uh, and we'll focus on three of these uh, in a little bit, but there's two other areas that we're, that we're not focusing on today in the webinar. You have to download and look at the book. And then we've also highlighted a few I apologize if my sound went out there a little bit. Um, so we have these five different sections of cases, and then we've also highlighted a few uh, um, cities to talk a little bit more in depth with some of the activities that they've done. Again, to help show other cities what a more uh, maybe comprehensive or purposeful approach looks like and give a little bit of an overview. So the basic layout of each case follows a four page spread. And each spread is consistently designed and includes a few key things that I'll just walk through quickly before uh, Claire, Eliza and John walk us through some actual cases and talk about them. So that each case starts with a before picture. What did the street look like before the change? What did it look like after the change? And some really quick um, overview of what happened, right? So when we're um, uh, conveying information to the public, to politicians in particular, right? Bullet points of what happened. So it's sort of a quick overview. The second page includes some key outcomes of the intervention, a before street cross section, and then after street cross section. And there's two color codings going on here. So in the, in the sort of little bottom bluish, uh, area is the space that's allocated for people to use, so not for motorized vehicles. And then the space in yellow is the actual intervention that happened uh, during COVID. So in this case, the entire street was turned over to the use of uh, people moving about on foot or skateboard or pogo stick or roller skate, et cetera. And then there's this uh, a bar of information that provides some more detailed technical information about what the street, uh, the, the layout, the right of way, the ADT. And then we've create, tried to capture the before and after space of that right of way that is uh, available to non-motorized use. So when page one and two are opened together, they look like this, and then we have page three and four that provide additional context that tries to help give you or whoever the reader is a little bit more uh, flavor for what is the street, what happened, uh, what's its context, um, things that were successful, things that didn't go uh, uh, as, as well as planned. And this, these three and four follow this uh, our, our context, but each case has a slightly different element uh, in this aspect. So this sort of four page spread uh, repeats, repeats, repeats. So it's very easy to open up a new case and get the information right away. And of course, there's a, a little bit of extra information about the uh, household income of the area, population size of the, of the city, uh, and so forth. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Claire, who will go through some of the cases on uh, ranking on, on bikeways. And I'm going to still be the controller of the slide. So Claire, just let me know uh, when to switch. Great, thanks, Mark. So my name is Claire and I'm one of the graduate students that worked on this project. And I'll be talking today about bikeways and how cities from around the world began to implement quick build bike lanes and cycle tracks to support a variety of city goals. Many of these bikeways were intended to support active transportation and recreational cycling. Some bike lanes were also meant to support transit lines and provide mobility options for those who could no longer use transit. Examples in our book are from a wide variety of cities, from Boston, Massachusetts, to Burlington, Vermont, to Bogota, Colombia. These bike lanes took a variety of forms, from piloting cycle tracks using cones to full-fledged redesigns. For the most part, cities selected locations for bikeways based on previous research and outreach that identified areas with a high need for better bike infrastructure. 
Reduced traffic volumes gave cities a chance to pilot new design ideas, and many of these designs have been tweaked based on resident feedback. I'll be discussing two examples from our book. One is from Austin, Texas, and the other one is from Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, next slide. So one great example of a pandemic response bikeway comes from Austin, Texas. Uh, this top photo is a photo of Pleasant Valley Bridge, which connects two sides of a multi-use pathway system on either side of the river. Previously, this bridge did not include any bicycle infrastructure, resulting in cyclists frequently using the narrow sidewalk to cross the river. This created conflicts between pedestrians and cyclists who had to squeeze past each other in a four-foot space, which was exacerbated during the COVID-19 lockdowns as trail use increased and it became even more important to provide safe distance between users. Pleasant Valley Bridge was also considered a high injury corridor and presented safety issues for all modes of transportation traveling through the area. Next slide. So in response, the city tore down the chain link fence separating the road from the sidewalk and reallocated one of the vehicle lanes for bicyclists. They used cones to designate one lane for two-way bicycle traffic. Next slide. Interestingly, the city also had plans to construct a separate bike and pedestrian bridge to cross the river uh, near Pleasant Valley Road. In 2013, the city began a public engagement process to address this gap in the bicycle network. Uh, during the initial process, they, instead of the bike and pedestrian bridge, they proposed a redesign that would be very similar to the pilot project that happened during the pandemic, which was removing one of the vehicle lanes for two-way bike traffic. However, in 2013, the public pushed back against this idea, arguing that it would lead to worsening congestion. This factor contributed to the current proposal for the construction of a uh, completely separate bike and pedestrian bridge. However, when the city implemented the lane reconfiguration during the pandemic, public response has been overwhelmingly positive as a result of this project. And actually, since our book has been published, Austin has begun construction to create separated shared use paths on either side of Pleasant Valley Bridge until the separate bridge can be completed. This case study is interesting because it il illustrates two major themes of our book. First, that public opinion can change with pilot projects. And second, that cities can create short-term change in response to changing conditions, even when they may already have a plan in the long-term to meet future needs. Next slide. Uh, so another of my favorite examples from our book uh, comes from Miami Beach. This example comes from Washington Avenue, which is a recently redeveloped business district. Previously, the street was a four lane road with two lanes of vehicle traffic in each direction and parking on either side of the road. Although there were sharrows indicating that vehicles should share the lane with bicyclists, the speed limit was 35 miles per hour, which significantly reduced the comfort and safety for bicycle riders on the road. Next slide. The city of Miami Beach was able to implement a major redesign quickly and cheaply by restriping the road to eliminate one vehicle lane in each direction and moving the parking lane away from the sidewalk. This created a buffer for a newly painted bicycle lane on each side of the street. This was a major step for the city who had never implemented parking protected bike lanes before. In addition, it provided space for restaurants to set up parklets in the streets for seating. Businesses that took advantage of the seating opportunity did 30% better during the pandemic than those who did not set up the outdoor seating. The city also reduced the speed limit to 25 miles per hour, which increased comfort for both cyclists and pedestrians and transformed Washington Avenue into a street where people could enjoy the many businesses located along the corridor. Next slide. At first, the city experienced problems with drivers blocking the bike lane and parking in the bike lane. In response, the city made sure to include adequate signs to show drivers where and how to park. Although this project looks like a major overhaul, it is really just paint and restriping. The city of Miami Beach is remaining flexible on how, how to allocate the space in the future, and they may change the design depending on use and change in demand. Washington Avenue provides a great example of how cities can be nimble and creative when implementing pilot projects to respond to changing situation. Thanks, and I'll now pass it off to Eliza to talk about slow streets. Thanks, Claire. My name is Eliza Whalen, and I will be talking about slow streets during COVID-19. So first off, the name slow streets refers to streets that have been open to pedestrians and cyclists by closing the roadway, either partially or entirely to cars. And this design intervention emerged from the need for physical distance, for more outdoor space close to home, 
and to provide efficient mobility for essential workers. To implement this change, cities needed very little and used things like barricades and sandwich boards and even parked cars and trash cans. Today, I'll talk through two examples in Salt Lake City and Oakland. Next slide. Looking at Salt Lake City, 4th Avenue was part of the Stay Safe, Stay Active Streets program. It is a local street in the Avenue's neighborhood of Salt Lake City, which is close to downtown Salt Lake and landmarks like the Utah State Capitol Building and Temple Square. To select streets, the city consulted past planning work and solicited feedback on a public survey that received over 6,000 responses. In addition to, survey, to the survey, streets were also selected based on factors like walkability, community vision, geographic equity, ease of implementation, connections to existing parks and trails, hospital and emergency routes, transit routes, and traffic patterns. Next slide. As you can see here, closing 4th Avenue to vehicles opened an additional 34 feet of roadway for cyclists and pedestrians. One of the primary outcomes recorded was that from early to late June, pedestrian volumes increased by 59% and cyclist volumes increased by 48% on these designated slow streets. Next slide. Another outcome is that residents put their own spin on the program. So while initially open for active recreation, residents hosted small physically distanced concerts and outdoor movie nights. While this program has now been discontinued, it demonstrates that these impactful changes can be quickly implemented to respond to changing community needs. With the successful implementation and response of this program, maybe Salt Lake City will be more likely to implement temporary pilot projects in the future. And now I'll shift to talking about Oakland. Next slide. The Oakland Slow Streets program is one of the narratives we wrote in the book, which were less focused on street level changes and more focused on the overall programs. Some other narratives you can find in the book are for Portland and Paris. And Oakland similarly opened streets to people to promote safe physical activity by creating more physical distancing. And the city explicitly sought to address inequities for areas that have limited access to other forms of public open space. This program was also grounded in past planning work, specifically the 2019 Let's Spike Oakland Strategic Long Range Plan which engaged over 3,500 residents. Slow streets in Oakland began with four and a half miles launched in April, 2020 and achieved 21 miles by July, as you can see in this map. Next slide. To create closures, the city provided necessary infrastructure such as signage and barricades and also empowered residents to slow their own streets with parked cars or trash cans. Oakland also prioritized meaningful public engagement with an online map and survey that residents could use to suggest new routes and locations, as well as provide feedback on existing and proposed routes. 75% of these survey respondents indicated that they supported this program. However, these initial respondents were predominantly white of higher incomes and from North Oakland. These response demographics reinforced the need for the city to partner with community-based organizations serving Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, communities living with lower incomes, and neighborhoods throughout the city to gather more representative feedback. Next slide. As the city moves into phase two of the program, it's exploring ways to make some of these temporary changes permanent and to better address community needs. To do this, they're continuing to collect feedback for each slow street from nearby residents and businesses, they're prioritizing streets based on their geographic equity toolbox. And then based on this evaluation, signage and barricades will either be upgraded to more durable materials or will be removed. For example, Oakland received a grant from Smart, Smart Growth America to pilot a solution for more aesthetically pleasing and robust barricades. Partnering with an East Oakland-based artist, Jonathan Brumfield, the city installed four planter barricades in the neighborhood as you can see in this image. The artist engaged with both the city and local residents to create designs that reflect the neighborhood culture. Oakland demonstrates that these projects can be ongoing and updated to reflect feedback and demand. And to wrap up, I want to reinforce that these examples show that slow streets can be implemented at different scales and levels of permanence. 
But these quick changes demonstrate that pilot projects are an effective and often successful way to respond to dynamic community needs. Cities can leverage past planning work to help ground their efforts, can pull on past community engagement and sustain community engagement uh, to sustain these changes and ensure they respond to community needs. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to John to talk about street dining. Thanks, Eliza. Well, good morning. My name is John Larson Friend, and today I'll be talking about rethinking streets for dining. During our team's research for this book, we found that one of the most ubiquitous changes that city, cities were making to their streets during COVID-19 were related to dining out options and restaurants. This is likely due to the strong economic and social ties that small businesses have to cities, especially those in the downtown cores. So today I will highlight two specific street reallocations with slightly different though successful approaches. The first will be West Broadway in Eugene, which underwent a seasonal change to the street. And the second will be LaSalle Road in West Hartford, which is undergoing a more permanent redesign. Next slide. So this first case I'm gonna highlight is West Broadway in downtown Eugene, Oregon. Obviously this street reallocation case is special to those of us who worked on the book as the University of Oregon, where we all either attend or teach at is in Eugene. In 2020, the city of Eugene created a program to allow restaurants to apply for a temporary permit, allowing expanded seating areas into sidewalks and on-street parking spaces. This program was aligned with the governor's emergency orders, plus the city recognized the need for more space for their local businesses to thrive during the economic downturn. In this specific case, the city worked with businesses along West Broadway between Willamette and Olive Streets, to close the street to cars and open it to pedestrians and dining areas for businesses. Next slide. So as we can see here, this was a relatively radical move by the city to disallow cars from one of its most vital downtown streets, while allowing pedestrians and active transportation the room to patronize the local businesses and feel a greater sense of safety during the pandemic. It is important to note that a similar project had been attempted in years past, but was considered to be a failure due to the type of businesses that were located along the street at that time, thus hadn't been pursued since then. Due to the existing form of the street, with the multi-story buildings on either side, trees down the middle and on the sidewalks, the street was successfully changed from a car-centric area into a sort of living room outdoor, uh, outdoor living space. People who visited had enough space to move about freely and eat safely away from other people. Next slide. During our research, we found that quick changes like this one were pretty common across the US and even the world. So the question remains, will cities continue these programs as the world moves forward from COVID-19? So on a personal note, it was really fun to see this street that is only eight blocks away from where I currently live be transformed into a space for people over cars. That being said, I do hope that the city of Eugene strongly considers continuing and even expanding the program into the future. Next slide. The second case I wanna highlight is LaSalle Road in West Hartford, Connecticut. The city took steps in summer 2020 to redesign four streets in West Hartford, including this one, LaSalle. The street or the city worked with local businesses, business owners to get feedback on the redesign before finalizing. In the end, the city changed the street from a two way, two lane road to a single lane, one way, and created a total of 11 dining corrals using 71 parking spaces across the four streets. In implementing the pilot program using the Connecticut governor's emergency orders, the city was able to take steps to show businesses and patrons how effective the reallocation of street space for people can be for the local economy and how redesigns can make streets more attractive to be in outside of a car. Next slide. Looking at design, we can see here that the town of West Hartford was able to successfully expand the space for people from just 30 feet to a whole 75 feet at its widest. The city used plastic barriers and some restaurants built their own more appealing barriers to create spa spatial separation and safety from cars passing through to truly create a space specifically designed for people. Next slide. According to a March 2021 story by NBC Connecticut, just to update you all, Mayor Sherry Cantor has proposed a new town ordinance to make the outdoor dining program permanent. 
The reporter on the story also included feedback from restaurants along LaSalle Road who expressed strong support for the new ordinance. Through the pilot program, the city was able to show the community and restaurant owners the proposed changes temporarily, which built up its popularity. Cases like these are really important because they are examples of how pilot programs can be key to building public support for positive people-centric changes to our streets. Thank you all so much. And I will now hand it back over to Mark. Great, thank you, uh, John, Claire, and Eliza. And um, I hope everyone uh, uh, listening uh, gets a sense of um, how amazing these students are and why the project turned out as nicely as it did. And it was really a, a fantastic group of people uh, working on this project, taking what was a 18 month project for the previous two books uh, and doing it in about six months uh, uh, this time around. Uh, so, so thank you very much. So a few sort of larger lessons uh, to wrap this up, and then we can engage in a, in a conversation uh, and, and respond to any uh, questions uh, that anyone has. So uh, throughout the presentation, uh, uh, John and Eliza and Claire shared some of the lessons that we did learn uh, throughout this around pilot projects, around embedding things in some older plans and some quick changes. So just to summarize some of uh, our insights and and, and our own reflections about this project, and because there were many more cases that we were looking at than got included in the book. But what was really clear is that there are examples of street changes that were happening in all kinds of communities. And this was not just big cities uh, in what we might uh, call sort of politically progressive places. There are all kinds of communities, uh, small and large, for all kinds of different reasons. So some uh, just to bring more open space closer to where people live, some to focus on economic development, some just to create a place making opportunities to socially gather, some to uh, make it easier to, to move about from place to place uh, by foot or by bike in a safer way. And so that was a real important lesson uh, and insight for us that this really didn't have a, you know, a typical kind of political uh, side of it. It really is, uh, these types of examples are happening in all kinds of communities all throughout the country and throughout the world. But we focus mostly on the US minus one case study of Paris and one case from Bogota. And that the quick changes were usually really good changes, right? That the world didn't end because uh, the public space was reduced, the public from, from the use of private cars and then reallocated to something else. Right, the idea of reallocating the public street to a different function and a different use, different public use. These changes that, that different cities took on were almost always really good, even if there was, uh, if they were quick, not as much public process as may have happened in the past. Like the the examples and the and the steps that cities took were not like radical, out of the blue sort of things. They're, using practices that have been implemented throughout the world for a long time and just doing them more quickly. And it turns out when, as, as all students uh, said, when you can do pilot projects that are quick and give more people in the community an opportunity to experience something different in how their street works, uh, especially when it's more sort of people-oriented, place-based uh, oriented, uh, uh, the public likes it. So that was um, almost always the case. And the other thing that was, um, that said a little bit, um, a little bit surprising I think for us is that um, we were expecting more communities to be more bold given the scale of the pandemic, the scale of the need and the uh, relatively, uh, non-threatening nature of the changes that cities were making. We found that also there were projects here and there, uh, but not as ubiquitous throughout a community and uh, as we might have expected. And so um, some communities were and are a bit timid. So some communities implemented some of these changes, these pilot changes to great success. And then as, uh, as, our, as things were opening back up in terms of um, 
you know, lockdowns and, and so forth, some communities undid their changes, even though they were popular. And so there's some big open questions about the future, right? What of these changes will become permanent? What lessons did communities learn that might translate into different uh, ways of acting into the future? So that's, a, that's an, an open question. We also think that one of the, the reflections here is that, um, you know, it might be time to revisit um, the excessive public processes that often happen on street changes before pre-COVID, right? So it opens up the question to us, you know, what is the proper default purpose of a street? If as a community, we think that the default purpose of the street is to move vehicles, you know, unimpeded and to store our private vehicles on that public space, then anytime there's a change proposed to that space, right, that feels like a threatening to do the default uh, status quo, that results in a big public process in uh, which is often contentious and hard to do things. But if instead our, the default changes of what the purpose of the street is, instead of just moving and storing private vehicles to something else, then maybe not as much public process is actually necessary to make small logical changes that open up that public street to more uses. So um, uh, we'll see. Um, but the the um, the excessive, uh, I think we think that uh, oftentimes those processes are a bit excessive and de default to one view of the street that clearly through all these pilot programs, there are other ways to think about what the default nature of the street or some streets within a community might be. So we think that it's time for communities to really revisit um, where and how the public is engaged on a street by street retrofit which is different than engaging the public on a vision for the community's future and then giving the go ahead for individual projects to be carried out uh, uh, without necessarily excessive public engagement. So those are some of the lessons that we learned. And um, I also wanna put out here, that in addition to thanking Claire and Eliza and John, and also Danielle uh, Lewis, and Nat Kataoka and Professor Rebecca Lewis for this fantastic team of putting together this resource. We also wanna thank NITSI for their support. This was a, a, a mid a course correction for a project to take advantage of, a, a, that might not be the right word, but uh, given the middle of the typical project cycle within NITSI is when um, the pandemic emerged and so we really appreciate NITSI's nimbleness of being able to redirect some of its priority uh, to this project so that we could work on documenting what was happening in different communities uh, as, it, as things were unfolding uh, during this current pandemic. So thank you very much for everyone for tuning in. I can pass it on to, to Brandon. I know there might be a few questions that we didn't, haven't really been able to look at as we've been speaking. But I'll pass it back to Brandon, maybe to curate the conversation from here. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, that was a great presentation by all four of you. Um, and we do still have time uh, for your questions. We have a few in and we're going to start addressing those. But uh, feel free to add to it uh, the conversation by putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, so, yeah, there. I think there's um, a lot of different aspects in these questions, and a lot of it is about you know um, how people came up with the different decisions on what to do. And so, with the first question, really talking about that balance of the you know the community versus top-down decisions and and with this being such a quick uh one year time time frame and and um getting things going um there was less public engagement mark so um you know what degree was participation in general part of the design implementation or evaluation um in in these projects that you've you've found yeah, I think I'll I'll turn that over to Eliza to take a stab at that one. 
Absolutely. So first, um, addressing kind of the top down versus bottom up initiatives, I want to express that we did see a mix of interventions um, and that genesis. So for example, Walla Walla, which is one case we didn't cover today was um, initiated by residents and business owners and then um, brought to the city uh, to get on board, which is a, a really great example of seeing residents and business owners take that initiative and advocate for um, their community. Additionally, in terms of the level of participation that also varied, so I very much want to acknowledge that a lot of this work was grounded in class planning work with really robust engagement. Um, so as we saw in Austin and in Oakland, for example, um, there were community visioning exercises and strategic plans that were leveraged into these interventions. And then almost all cities conducted some kind of engagement throughout the process to get feedback, figure out what was working, uh, figure out what wasn't, and make changes as they moved into move to permanence um, if they chose to do so. From what we looked at, those primarily took place in the form of surveys, um, which is maybe in part due to some of the challenges of the COVID-19 era. Um, however, it's interesting to see cities leverage that work and sustain some engagement to check in with the community and ensure that things are still working and make adjustments if residents have any suggestions. Thank you for that question. Great. Um, so we also have questions sort of um, in regards to, to equity, mobility, you know, transit. So just try and touch on that. Um, we saw most of the changes that were talked about there, the images shown involved cars, but can you talk about any changes involved the streets with transit routes and how this affected transit or maybe was this something that was purposely avoided? Yeah, I'll I'll take the lead on that and then, but I'll invite everyone else to, to join in afterward. I, I was just able to scan through all the really great questions. Um, so nice to have such smart people actually paying attention <laughs> to all this. So thank you. Um, I'll, let me start by uh, giving a couple of high level uh, uh, things. Well, I'll, I'll, first I'll talk about transit, then I'll give some high level stuff because there's some sort of detailed questions. Um, I'm actually not uh, remembering now that transit came in much with the cases that we were looking at. Um, you know, many of the cases were launched in the earlier stages of the pandemic. And of course, most driving and, and, and a lot of transit were uh, reduced at that point. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity to sort of relook as things have been opening up and thinking about the future. And then to, to the, there's a lot of detailed questions about um, curb cuts and access and uh, other things like that. So um, I, I have a few thoughts. So, so at the high level, um, we were uh, using evidence that we could have at the time to put together this resource. And so we were often relying on the local officials or local news accounts of how things were going at the time that we put this together. And so there is likely a lot more information to be derived from individual communities about either how they were judging success, how they are thinking about things in the future, how maybe they are uh, morphing some, some temporary uh, changes into more permanent ones that have a more comprehensive and thoughtful design approach. And so uh, I think one of the values of a resource book like this is that it provides uh, the type of example that might be relevant for your own community that you're looking at and uh, some contact information if you wanna contact the, the city that we talked about in the book, you can follow up directly and get some of the detailed information that's most relevant for what you're looking at. I think some of the issues around um, I know there was a question on access about car access in the future, if there's parking was limited and will people still be able to access that in the future? And this is just an open question for how cities design things. So when you design a commercial area that is almost entirely car dominant, you are really restricting access to people who don't drive. And so this finding the right mix is all about, um, you know, what finding the right mix for the future. Uh, most of our communities have way more car parking uh, spaces that are needed. You know, some estimates for cities are range from, there's three to eight um, car parking spaces for every car that exists in a community. So 
the fact that some um, uh, par car parking spaces are being repurposed for dining or for bikeways to me is not a, a you know a dis discriminatory activity against people who are car dependent, but is a bit of a rebalancing act uh, to find the sweet spot to maximize placemaking, maximize access for, for multiple ways that people are, are getting around. So anyway, that's just a, sort of our, our general philosophy. I'll invite if uh, Claire, or Eliza, or John wants to add anything else to any of these really great questions. I think I might add with the, uh, the street dining and car parking, just that a lot of the businesses chose to repurpose the parking spots in front of their businesses for dining. Um, and so I think that was a really interesting approach uh, because it kind of allowed businesses to make the decision for themselves if they'd rather um, prioritize parking or, or be able to use the street. Um, and so I think especially looking at the Miami Beach example, it's been really successful uh, and the businesses have, uh, have done a lot better because of that. Um, and uh, they also kind of cite the bike lane as, as a reason for that increased business activity as well. Um, so I think that's um, important to consider and, and that there has been a lot of outreach and engagement with businesses in this process as well. Um, a lot of cities have conducted business surveys and, um, and, and other ways just to gauge the temperature of business owners in the area um, throughout these processes. I'll just also add, we did not include any um, bad quote unquote examples. Uh, so we purposely, uh, while there's obviously lessons to learn and things that didn't go according to plan, we uh, we just chose to focus on things that had a had a pretty good outcome, so that we so that other communities could, you know, learn from some of those successes. Although clearly there's an opportunity to learn from things that didn't go so well. As all, there's an interesting question that's larger than this project about how to change metrics for larger institutions like state departments of transportation that are really worried about traffic impact analysis and um, you know making a uh, does making a change to a street somehow make it harder to drive and i mean these are clearly places that need to be refined because never does traffic impact analysis say like oh it's a project that you're doing actually increase the number of walking, biking, and transit trips. If not, then you need to invest in it. It's always very car-centric. So, I mean, that's a totally different conversation of, of how to reform our, our state DOTs to get into the 21st century and rethink the use of the street for more than just the, the unimpeded movement uh, of cars. But that's, there's my commentary and my invitation to have a separate conversation about that. Great. So, Matt, I and push you a little bit though on the the you know the not necessarily the bad um, but what the future looks like right so these largely are temporary we talked about how they're low cost changes um, and what's what do you see in terms of um, going forward and the return the near normalization like um, so we have. What, what kind of tools can uh, practitioners use to maybe promote continuing these sort of um, pedestrian bike friendly things, such as like collection, has it been collection of data from some of these pilot projects? Again, I'll, I'll turn over to Claire, Eliza or John, if you want to take a first stab at that. If not, I'm happy to. Hearing no volunteers. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the evidence, not just from during the, this COVID time, but um, probably over the last 20 years, not just in the US context, but other places in the world, is that these types of quick pilot projects uh, are a way to help more of the public understand what can be different about the street and can be a way to make things more permanent going forward. I think one of the biggest barriers to, to making these types of changes more ubiquitous uh, in more places and more of our communities is that it's really hard for many people to understand what, what, what can be different about a street. Um, because most of us haven't grown up in places of cities that our streets are, are anything other than for moving and storing private vehicles. And so I think one of the things uh, that's really clear is that the pilot project 
at a minimum is a way to introduce to more people in a community what's actually possible, right? The idea that you can have a, an ad hoc outdoor movie watching gathering on and in the street is amazing, right? And if you, that's something to, if you were to propose that ahead of time, it's generally not the type of thing that people would think would be a, be a possibility, but how un unbelievable to have that experience. And clearly there's, there's programs like this throughout the country, especially in the, around the world, like in the, in the bike world or actually in the sort of transportation world, there's all kinds of open street um, sort of events that happen in different cities through the year that, that open up the street to people walking or biking or pogo sticking or picnicking. Um, so these types of opportunities to open up the, the experience for more people in the community to understand what the purpose or what the function of their streets can be for not just moving and storing private vehicles, but they are places where we gather and interact and uh, they can be places to move in, in other ways as well. I think is, is a big lesson here. Whether cities make this stuff permanent or not, that's an open question. I mean, my own opinion is they have to. If, if our communities are really serious about uh, addressing climate change and meeting their obligations, if our communities are really serious about addressing structural inequality, if our communities are really interested in addressing household affordability, which is the combination of uh, affordable housing and your transportation costs, if our communities are really serious about addressing issues of economic development and independence and freedom uh, for their populations, they have to redesign their streets for better uses. We cannot have systems that are uh, basically ubiquitous car access uh, and discriminatory uh, against all other uses. So whether our communities will be up to the challenge, that's, that's the question. And so what I see going forward is uh, some communities will actually, will absolutely take the lessons of their experience, especially over these last 14 months and move forward with some of these changes more permanently and more comprehensively and other communities will revert back to how things were pre-pandemic. And there's gonna start to be a big, I think, split in our, in our community design in that way. Um, and so we'll see how much self-sorting there gets to be then in the population and businesses where they locate within our remote workforce. If we continue on remote working and, and for, for a portion of the population and more people have a choice of where they wanna live and work, Maybe there'll be some self-selection based on the way that these different communities design themselves and their transportation systems in their streets. But that's kind of the big open question going forward to me. Well, you certainly touched on a lot there, Mark. Um, and, and I'm wondering though, in studying these different cities and the different examples that were given, um, what sort of feedback or communication did you have from the practitioners? Um, you know, it, it strikes me that uh, putting like a barrier in someone's street is uh, very visible. And all of a sudden it's, it's like you're talking about Mark with the community. If they weren't involved in it, but it turns out something they really enjoy, that's great, but it's right, it's gotta be in, they got to take advantage of this this time to to connect with the community. And and do you have any feedback on that? Sure. Um, I mean, so it wasn't so as part of our project, we were not reaching out to the general public or or any of the stakeholder groups in a robust way. So this project does not include that type of data. Um, although those are Great things, generally speaking, the local cities would be uh, hopefully engaging in, in their in broad stakeholder kind of feedback. Um, and, and I think we heard from uh, all three, uh, John, Eliza, and Claire reported back on, on some of the communities where some of that initial feedback was, was taking place. But this is a, these are fantastic opportunities um, uh, to get feedback. You know, what worked, what didn't work? Do you like this? Is it? meeting your needs in the community, um, uh, uh, et cetera. But again, like this is a, you know, every community is a little bit different and um, taking a different approach on how 
serious they are to get that information, how they want to use that information to feed into things more permanent going forward, or if these were really just considered you know, super temporary and you know, as soon as you know, given the go ahead, they'll be removed uh, to go back to kind of quote unquote normal pre-COVID times. All right, well, thanks so much um, for all, to all of you for joining us today. It's, it's been a great presentation by Mark, Claire, Eliza, and John. Um, Want to wish uh, the three of them the best um, going forward, graduating in the spring. That's exciting. Um, and Mark, hopefully we'll, we'll see you back here again for another webinar sometime soon. Um, yeah, so anything, any last thoughts before we end this? I do have one last thought, and that is um, the three students that were part of this are all graduating like in a couple months. And Claire, congratulations to Claire, is uh, gainfully em employed with a, a transportation consulting firm starting in June. Uh, and Eliza and John are currently in the middle of their, or the beginning stages of um, searching for postgraduate school employment. So that I can give them my unequivocal 100% full recommendation of how amazing and awesome they are. So here's some two extremely talented people uh, so I just want to throw it out there. And thank you, Nitsi, for hosting us. And thank you to this amazing team of students uh, uh, for the participation in the book um, and also on this webinar. It's fantastic. Great. And yeah, we will we will send out an email and then we'll have a, a survey link. Um, and so please fill that out and give us some feedback. Um, and check out the, the guidebook. Um, Mark has a couple other guidebooks as well available through Nitsi. So I encourage you to check those out um, and yeah, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.